Well, good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm Roger Adamson, the President of SARA. I open this meeting by recognising that we're meeting on the lands of the Kaurna people and we pay our respects to the elders, past, present and future. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Jane Musserin from Coda, Caroline Barker from Age Rights Advocacy Service and Vanessa Clark from the Office for the Aging World. I'd also, on behalf of the SARA members, thank the Honourable Christopher Picton, the Honourable Stephen Wade, and the Honourable Frank Pagello for making themselves available for this event today. During what I'm sure is a very busy time leading up to the state election on March 19th. We are also, <coughs> pardon me, we are also aware many of our members are not able to attend today. And therefore, we are video recording this meeting and we'll be putting the video up on our website for members to view. We'll notify members how to gain access to that video via an email in the next week or so. We're grateful that Parliament gave us a three-year review period when they proclaimed the current Act back in January 2018. And we also acknowledge the Retirement Villages Act of 2016 did go a long way to providing a better balance between the rights of residents and operators. However, some operators and their corporate lawyers are still not abiding by the spirit and intention of the Act. For this reason, we feel it is vitally important that the Act be refined, the wording tightened, and changes made to sections to protect current and future retirement village residents from these operators who are using the current weaknesses in the legislation to their abusive and unfair advantage. SARA members have been fighting for these changes for more than six years, even leading up to the 2016 Act. And many of us are anxious to see these much needed reforms happen now. For this reason, the Sarva Committee felt it was ideal time to call this meeting and to allow our members to hear directly from those parliamentary voices with the greatest influence on the outcome of the review. We will hear their views on the recommendations of the recent PEG Consultancy Report and the actions they propose for the review going forward. I'd now invite Stephen, uh, sorry, whoops, hang on, we've got to have a change here because uh, Christmas hasn't arrived yet. But, yeah. but uh, thank you, um, Frank Pangello, if you would like to step up and uh, let us have your views on the uh, subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger, and uh, thank you all for coming here today. Uh, uh, it's quite a contentious issue and it's something that certainly Parliament needs to uh, address. Um, can I just say that um, SA Best and the party I represent, there's two of us in the Upper House, uh, we certainly have a very strong policy to protect the rights of ageing South Australians. And that means not only those in uh, aged care facilities but also those in retirement villages. Uh, as we know, retirement villages offer significant and social, uh, and social and economic benefits to residents and the community at large. However, they do not attract any government support for these purpose-built facilities and it hinders their expansion during a time of rising house prices, uh, downsizing and an increasing age population. South Australia currently has uh, 534 registered retirement villages, housing more than 26,000 people. Now, I'm in your age group, so I also need spectacles, and I try not to get away with it, so I'm going to have to put them on. Um, as I said, South Australia has 534 registered retirement villages, housing more than 26,000 people. That's a significant number, and is covered by the Residential Villages Act 2016. Retirement villages will continue to evolve into integrated facilities offering assisted 
living and care services before transitioning to aged care. Now, SA Best will explore ways where the government can assist further development and encourage facilities which support people to stay healthier and safe for longer. The Act has been subject to an ongoing review which has shown it needs urgent improvements that will provide fairer outcomes for residents who can be financially disadvantaged by terms which favour the operators, particularly harsh exit entitlement policies or trying to strike a balance with operators. Now, SA Best is supportive of the South Australian Retirement Villages Association's push for legislative changes that give greater, a greater clarity, accountability and transparency of financial agreements, including budget expenditure, settling in periods, termination rights, age restrictions, and in there, uh, the question about whether under 55s should be admitted into uh, retirement villages, whether they come in uh, as uh, uh, paying right holders or, or as tenants. Uh, capping the term for charging occupancy fees to 10 years. Uh, cooling off period to be extended to at least 14 days. Repayment of entry fees if no contract is signed after cooling off. Mandatory codes of uh, practice and residence rights more and equal safe residence committees in the management of facilities, particularly where there may be an amalgamation of multiple sites. Exit fees to be paid promptly and within six months of vacant possession, and a review of other fees and charges, like insurance levied on residents for uh, operator-owned capital assets, uh, and access to legal advice on contracts and residence rights. Now, uh, I'll give you this commitment. I'm in the Upper House and I'll continue to be there for the next four years. And when Parliament resumes, uh, I, I intend to introduce Australian First legislation for the creation of a retirement commissioner within the Office of Ageing Well to oversee the operation of Retirement Villages Act, uh, manage and adjudicate disputes, uh, inform and educate people from all cultures about the ageing sector and their legal rights, enforce any penalties on operators and investigate any claims of abuse and whether protection needs to be provided. Retirement villages are on notice that, like aged care providers, they need to clean up their act. It was disappointing that they were not covered in the Royal Commission into Aged Care. Uh, in, in 2019, for instance, I've, I've, I've spoken to many people in, in residential villages in my four years in Parliament, but one in particular that uh, I investigated it was a serious complaint of elderly abusive residents by a manager and, a, and staff at one of the inner south retirement village complexes owned by one of the nation's biggest retirement village groups. Now, management cannot abuse, threaten or intimidate residents who have invested in these retirement villages and then think they can brush it aside or get away with it because old and vulnerable residents typically shy away from confrontation. And many residents are also unaware or unsure where they can turn to. We do have uh, agencies like Paris, we've got the uh, Age Rights uh, Care Quality Commission, uh, but many people are reluctant or don't know how to do that, and they need advice on doing that. I think one of the key areas, and I'm not sure whether it applies in your own villages, uh, but in this particular one, I was totally stunned that there was not a residence, not a group, a group representing the residents. And uh, you know, my office had to advise and help them in setting up a residence group in order for them to be heard by management. Now that should happen. Every village should have a residence group that represents the residents and does so without fear of intimidation or threats. And that's what needs to happen. And that's why I believe that a commissioner with sweeping powers can address this and other issues.
And I think the other thing that's important to all of you, the last thing you people want, or anyone entering into a retirement village uh, and, and having a look at these complex contracts, uh, they need legal advice. And there needs to be some kind of a mechanism that enables um, uh, people who are contemplating going into a village to be able to seek advice and see if it's right for them and also to understand what they get into rather than accept what uh, the retirement village is saying to you and then you just sign on the dotted line and then later on you find that there are issues. So that's why I'm intent on having a commissioner represent residential villages in South, well, re representing the residents of residential villages in South Australia as well as, of course, the villages themselves. They have it in New Zealand and it operates very effectively in representing the rights of people in villages. And the reason that you're probably all here today is because you're not being heard and you don't think you're being heard uh, and uh, you need somewhere to turn. And I think it's incumbent on the government uh, to be able to provide that assistance to you. And uh, that's what I intend to do. And I'll be, uh, I will be uh, introducing that legislation after May when Parliament resumes. Thanks, Roger. Thank you, Frank. We might call on Brian to uh, just ask a couple of questions from you, first of all, sure. if you don't mind. Thank you, everyone. Um, these are written questions that have been submitted by members um, before this meeting, and so we will deal with a couple of them. Frank, you talked about a commissioner. Uh, one of the issues that worries these residents is how is the commission going to be funded? Previously, it gets put on to the operators, the operators put it on to the residents. How do you envisage this commission to be? Well, as, as I indicated, it will be part of that government department currently there that was set up by the, uh, the previous government, uh, and, and, sorry, by the, uh, the uh, Marshall government, by Minister Wade. And look, I'll give him some credit uh, because he, you know, right at the beginning of uh, uh, their term, they certainly did make uh, strong efforts to improve uh, uh, the issue with aged and in our community. Uh, there is that area currently in, uh, in the wellbeing, aged and wellbeing area. I believe, from my inquiries, they it is currently staffed by about four, four, five, four, four. four. Uh, that have to look into these issues as well. But, you know, what they do is take the complaints uh, and assess them, but I don't think that they have uh, wide ranging powers to do something. And that's why we need a commission, a commissioner in there uh, to do that, and it'll have to be funded by the South Australian Government. Thank you. Um, third question The PEC report makes 60 recommendations. It is aimed at new and prospective residents moving into retirement villages. What action is to be, can you see being taken to protect these people which are having problems at the moment with the RV Act and the way it's operating and functioning? Well, look, the, um, the 60 recommendations need to be considered uh, by Parliament uh, to, uh, to, take, to take action. But I, I can assure you that uh, there are many of my colleagues, particularly in the Legislative Council and also in the House of Assembly, who are very strong in advocating for this Act back in 2016, who know that there are problems in residential villages and know that something needs to happen and for it to be fixed. The thing is, you don't all have time, do you, uh, waiting for politicians to get off their backsides and do something. So, you know, one of uh, my aims is to make sure that this happens very quickly into the new parliament uh, and we need to address it very quickly. Thank you. I've just got a couple of specific questions which you mentioned in your speech. One is compulsory by me. The current position is it com the compulsory by me is 18 months. Sabra is pushing for six months. 
What is your position on that proposal? Well, look, as I said, we support Sabra's position on it. Uh, however, we also need to engage with the operators themselves, as, you know, uh, to see what impact it has on them. And we always try and do the balancing act and go to both, both sides. But as we've seen it, it tends to disadvantage the residents. So we support that position. Yeah, part of the problem is you've got a huge legal team against people who are doing it um, as part of the, the service. Mm. That's part of the issue. And that is the issue. And I think I mentioned that uh, in my speech, that there needs to be adequate legal representation of people in residential villages. You know, you haven't got the money to go paying, you know, high power barristers to get an opinion to represent you. So that needs to be addressed as well. Alright, well uh, one of the items you did also mention is the capital item replacement fund. Um, we have in the industry a number of operators that are charging 1% per year of tenancy. And we have examples where people are leaving that village have to pay $157,000 in capital item replacement fund. What is your proposal to reduce this back to 10 years? Well, that's something that we will be looking at, at doing uh, and supporting that position that that happened. Uh, as I said, there needs to be greater transparency uh, in, these, uh, in these contracts uh, and also when uh, analysing the budgets of um, these residential villages. Uh, they need to be up front with just where the money is going and how much money is going in the outgoings and uh, other areas of spending. I mean, you've got your investment in there. You've got a stake in it. You've got a skin in the game. And you've got a right to know, uh, you know, uh, where the expenditure is and how that's managed. Thank you, Frank. No, um, for those who are not aware, part of the process is there will be a further discussion uh, document developed by Vanessa's team. Um, when that occurs, we'll be knocking on Frank's door asking for an audience and anyone else that's involved in the process to put our point of view forward very forcefully. <coughs> Yes, we thank you, Frank, for giving us your time today. We know it's um, probably a very busy time coming up to the election, perhaps not so much for you, but I'm no, sure is. you're still quite involved in lots of other things. So we do appreciate your time. We also appreciate the assistance you give to a lot of our members in your electorate. Thank you. OK, best laid plans of mice and men go astray. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, it's my pleasure now to invite um, the Honourable Stephen Way to the lectern to give us his review, <coughs> sorry, his expressions on the review and um, we'll have some questions for you as well. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, when I was younger, I used to associate this church with the uh, place that my sister-in-law was married, but I must admit, Savra forums in this venue are becoming so regular uh, <laughs> that uh, it should be renamed the Savra Church. <laughs> and, and, and may I take the opportunity to thank you again for, um, for being given, giving me the opportunity to come and have um, discussions with you. I acknowledge that uh, Roger Sant Adamson, the President of the uh, the South Australian Retirement Visited Residents, sorry, Retirement Villages Residents Association, the committee and members of SAVRA. Perhaps the only thing that changes is every now and again a president. Yes. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank SAVRA for organising this forum on the Retirement Villages Act and for the invitation to be involved. Um, in fact, if I can reflect, I suspect there's more people here uh, this forum than there was in the last one, which I think indicates an ongoing interest in the reform that's happening in the industry. I've enjoyed working with past President Bob Ainsworth and thank him and the Sabra Committee for the hard work and extensive submissions that have been made, have been made to the Act Review. 
From the outset, let's remind ourselves about our vision for retirement villages. Retirement villages provide older South Australians with the opportunity to access, access affordable accommodation in a community setting, with ongoing maintenance and sustainment of the property provided by the retirement village operator rather than the resident. For many South Australians, a move to a retirement villages, village has enriched their lives. For some, the move has been financially disadvantageous and some have felt trapped. I believe it's the responsibility of government to maximise transparency, to protect consumers and to promote a healthy retirement villages sector. It's important for older South Australians that the retirement village sector continues to provide sufficient, affordable and quality accommodation options. This is important not only for the residents themselves, but also for the state as a whole. The Marshall Liberal government is building a stronger future for South Australia. Since we were elected in 2018, South Australia has become the fastest growing state in the nation. By providing affordable accommodation for older South Australians, retirement villages facilitate the availability of affordable accommodation for other South Australians. As one family downsizes out of a property, this is an opportunity for another family to upsize to that property as that property better meets their needs. It's in the interest of the state as a whole to have a healthy retirement village industry. The requirement for retirement villages to be registered with the state government commenced in late 2006. The operation of retirement villages is now governed by the Retirement Villages Act 2016. The Act commenced in 2018 and was required by the Act itself to be reviewed three years after commencement. The 2016 Act introduced significant changes seeking to balance consumer protection with the interests of operators. Key changes included the introduction of a standard disclosure statement, the mandatory repayment of an exit fee, exit entitlement, and increased auditing and transparency measures. Some of the changes were predicted by operators to cause significant harm to the industry. The review was to consider whether this, the regulatory changes that the Act brought about have met their intended objectives and by implication whether they have had any negative unintended consequences. To support the legislative review of the Act, the Office for Aging World released a discussion paper through the Your Say website for public consultation from the 29th of January to the 16th of April 2021. The discussion paper um, both provided background information, reviewed components of the legislation and put forward discussion questions to elicit feedback. 187 submissions were received, three quarters of those from residents. Drawing on the discussion paper feedback, the review was undertaken by an independent consultant, Peg Consulting, during 2021. The final report was tabled in Parliament on the 18th of November 2021 and made 60 recommendations. The review found that the Act is generally considered a significant improvement on the previous version of the Act. However, the, the review found that there is room for improvement to the Act, in particular to improve transparency for both current and prospective residents. The need for further advice on some of the recommendations uh, is indicated in the report in areas such as the charging of sales commissions, accreditation standards, and the training and registration of village staff. I understand that some issues contained in the report are of particular interest to SAVRA. Some of the recommendations would have an impact across multiple areas of interest. For instance, the report recommended an overhaul of the retirement villages register to make it a significant source of information about the operation of the sector. The information that is recommended to be held on the register is extensive, ranging from compliance activity, the type of village, entry and exit payments, the length of time on the, the, length of time on the market, and insurance details. The report also recommends that disclosure statements disclose more information and contain worked calculations on exiting the village at specified time periods to provide clarity about all exit costs. The availability of this type of information combined with recommended changes to the, to the disclosure statement 
would ele elevate the transparency and improve the understanding of a prospective resident as to the housing option they are considering and the likely costs. The review has found that changes to premises condition reports introduced in 2018 have not achieved their intended objective of providing clarity around the condition and repair or replacement of items in a residence. Accordingly, the review recommends that the premises condition report be provided to a prospective resident as early as possible in the contracting process and contain information both about the condition as well as the responsibility for a repair and replacement of the unit. Financial matters remain a major point of contention. Further transparency measures are proposed, as well as recommendations to provide greater protection to residents in relation to increasing recurrent charges. Perhaps the most controversial aspect of the reforms in 2016 was the statutory repayment measure. I think statutory repayment enhances the retirement village option for many prospective residents. People are more likely to decide to move into a retirement village if they know they can leave the village. The review does not recommend a reduction in the statutory review period of 18 months, but it does advocate for information on turnover of units to be provided on the sorry, to the registrar to enable an assessment of impacts on the sector to be measured. There are currently 531 retirement villages in South Australia, providing 18,894 residences. I'm advised that in January 2018, there were 530 villages. 21 new villages have been completed and registered since, and 21 villages have been terminated or removed from the register. We know that disputes and disagreements do occur, and it's important that there be appropriate resolution mechanisms in place. The review identified that there are gaps in what disputes SACAT has empowered to adjudicate, and the report proposes that amendments be made to permit SACAT to determine a wider range of disputes, such as disputes arising uh, from a village's rules. The report puts forward a range of recommendations uh, to improve the operation of the Act based on the Act's object objects and priority given to clarity, transparency and improved protections. The re recommendations are currently being considered by government. I assure SAVRA that further scoping and consultation will occur with SAVRA and the broader sector before any legislative changes are brought to the Parliament by a Marshall Liberal government. I expect that a draft bill will go to Parliament in the second half of 2022. Of course, the legislation is only one part of the arrangements that need to be maintained and improved. The review recommendations endeavour to provide encouragement to all operators to operate in accordance with best practice without addressing every issue by legislative change. The government supports that approach. The state government also plays a key role ongoing day to day in relation to retirement villages. The legislation should not be a matter of set and forget. The retirement villages unit uh, within the Office for Ageing Well, and the units represented here today, provides information, assistance and education sessions on retirement villages matters, clarifying areas of concern, as well as providing a conciliation service to help resolve disputes between residents and operators. The unit investigates and assesses complaints and allegations of breaches of the, of the Act and regulations. And the, uni, the unit generally adopts an educational rather than adversarial approach to enforcement. However, I assure you the unit does maintain a compliance regime. For example, an annual compliance check is undertaken focusing on legislative provisions introduced to improve transparency of resident finances at annual meetings as well as resident protections. This has included ensuring certificates of title are properly endorsed to protect residents' interests in the village and financial transparency at annual meetings. In 2021, 14% of operators were randomly selected for audit. Pleasingly, the majority of provisions were, were, were complied with. Uh, there were three cases of minor non-compliances and four instances of moderate non-compliance. In each case, education has been provided to the operator and ongoing monitoring will occur. 
Beyond the Office for Ageing Well, I'm, I'm keen for my department to support residents of retirement villages to age well. That's why in December of last year, I launched an expanded home hospital service in a retirement village. My home hospital delivers care in the comfort and privacy of a patient's own home, including retirement villages. The service brings hospital level care to the patient in the form of doctors, nurses, allied health practitioners, sun x-rays, uh, blood tests, medication and other support services, including meals and personal care, depending on the patient's needs. Patients will receive daily visits and have regular contract, contact with the care team. The Marshall Liberal Government is committed to supporting South Australians to age well. As I've indicated through my speech, we, we see retirement villages as an opportunity to support South Australians to age well. Over our term in government, we have established the Adult Safeguarding Unit, which protects vulnerable adults, both ageing and living with a disability. We have updated legislation to strengthen support for advanced care planning. We've expanded the Strength for Life program to support the health of older South Australians. If re-elected, a Marshall Liberal Government will closely consider the report and recommendations of the Retirement Villages Act review and potential changes to the legislation. We will consult closely and extensively with stakeholders, and of course, particularly with Sandra. I thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you for your uh, comments, I greatly appreciate it. Um, one of the issues concerning Reds and Citizens Hall is that the PEG and Report 860 recommendations. Unfortunately, a lot of the recommendations don't fix the problems that people in this room are currently experiencing and have documented in submissions to PEG. What action will be taken to implement or listen to those concerns being expressed by these people? The, um, thanks, Brian. One thing that struck me looking at the, um, the SARA submission of April 2021 and the report itself is actually how much, how much the report does endorse the recommendations raised by SARA. Um, and in many cases, even if they, uh, even if they didn't uh, endorse the SARA proposal, they endorsed the SARA concern and indicated it was a, work, a piece for further work. I wonder if, you're, if your question actually um, is particularly focusing on issues that might need uh, conciliation, might need um, SACAP. Um, and uh, likewise, uh, as I said, it's, a, it's a, an evolving process and the uh, Retirement Villages Unit actively um, uh, tries to conciliate and improves its performance in conciliation. Um, but, um, but also the, the review does recommend that the range of disputes that can be taken to SACAP um, should be expanded um, and it may well be that some of the, the issues that you're raising uh, are appropriate matters for um, to be taken to SACAP. I appreciate that some um, that, that it's often quite daunting uh, to people for people to go to SACAP, but I would stress that um, SACAP does uh, allow for more than one person to become a party to an issue. Um, I know that the cyber report suggested that residence committees should be able to go to, to SACAP. Yes. Yeah. Um, the review doesn't recommend that, but, uh -huh. but I would stress that a, if you like, a group within a residence committee could work together uh, either with members of the other members of the committee or other residents to take a matter to SACA. Sorry to say, Kevin. Um, but, but again, that's, that is a matter. I, I would stress the review is not a draft bill. It's, it's, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a report. The, um, the work that the government will, will need to undertake is to uh, is to do further consultation and turn that report into a uh, into a draft bill, uh, and I assure you that Sabra, uh, if there's a Marshall Liberal government after next election, next election, uh, Sabra will be actively involved in that. Um, and the Sabra has demonstrated itself to be a uh, sophisticated stakeholder. The, the quality of this submission uh, is, uh, is is rare, if you like, in terms of um, in terms of submissions to. Um, Submissions to government reports. A high quality recommendation. Uh, SABRA has been uh, instrumental in not only the uh, 2016 legislation but the uh, development since. So, uh, that part we have no intention of that partnership stopping. 
And could just um, a side issue to that going to say, okay, the problem is a lot of the people that have an issue, by the time it gets there, are in their 80s. To go and go through that process with little support is quite daunting. So the simplest way is sit back and wait and just leave it alone. That's an issue that needs to be addressed. Can I just, you mentioned in your speech about the buyback situation. Um, Peg recommends another five years of consultation, collecting data. The problem is some of the people in this room won't be around when that happens in eight years' time. Can we possibly shorten up that time? Yeah, um, with all due respect, I, 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 I certainly appreciate that they said that, they, that we need more data. Um, I don't, don't think they said let's wait five years. Um, are you, are you that, that's the interpretation oh, yeah. we're putting yeah. on. Yeah. The, the next review is five years' time. Let's collect data, so we're assuming it's five years. Yeah. Like that data. Um, now, forgive me for this. I, Frank might know this. I don't know whether the I don't know whether the statutory review provision is a recurring review or whether it was a re review only. I think it was only actually my recollection was only a review the first first three years after the commencement of the act. Um, so whether you whether, whether you're looking looking forward to a statutory review or dreading one, um, it may not be mandated. But but personally, I think I, I would um, I would welcome a review in three to five years' time. Because it is such an evolving area, um, now I, I might uh, I might I might be slightly historically um, out of whack, but let's put it this way: in 2015-16, when the 2016 Act was being developed, um, apartments were a relatively new element in um, in in uh, sort of if you like the, the landscape in Adelaide. Uh, but increasingly, we're seeing apartments becoming part of the uh, the aged accommodation sector. Um, and I think one of the most interesting um, developments um, in recent years, from my point of view, is the, the Carmelite development on the corner of Glen Osmond Road and Crossroad. My understanding, and I might have it wrong, uh, is that the, um, the upper level is, um, is uh, apartments. I'm, I'm not sure whether they're, they've held my title or that they're a retirement village. Could, work, could easily be a retirement village. Uh, and the nursing, there is a nursing home on the lower floors. So, as a as a couple, where one member of the family might well um, uh, have increased needs before another member of the family, they can actually stay within the same community, stay within the same facility. So, the point I'm trying to make is that um, I, I would welcome regular, even if not statutorily required, reviews because we are in a, a dynamic environment. We're in a dynamic environment in terms of the accommodation industry. We're also in a dynamic environment in terms of um, what it means to be ageing in a modern Australia. Thank you. I've just got one final question. It's on the current island replacement fund on people living a village. And currently it's uncapped. In some, in, in my own village, um, I've been there 17 years. When I leave, I'm expected to pay one cent for each year I've lived in the village. So that means, in my case, it will be about $150,000 I have to pay. Why cannot the capital item fund be capped to a set time frame? Yeah, well, I certainly, um, I certainly You're not reading my notes. <laughs> <laughs> He's no. got a copy of what I <laughs> Yeah, so I've probably, probably read, read the same report. Um, <laughs> Yeah, my understanding was that the um, that the review talked about um, transparency rather than a formal capping. Um, I'm sure that's an issue that we just discussed in the, in the parliament because, uh, if you like, you need to have a basic framework within which there is flexibility uh, on agreements. I, I personally do believe there needs to be flexibility in agreements. Every person is different. Every facility is different. But there needs to be a basic framework. Um, yes. so I was having a chat on the way in, well, and uh, we're con contrasting the um, the real estate institute has their standard contracts, uh, and certainly uh, over the time when I've been looking at retirement, it would be easier if we had a standard contract like the real estate institute. 
But increasingly, I've become aware that there is such diversity in the sector that would actually constrain people's capacity to find a, a, an arrangement that suited them. But we need to make sure that there is a, a framework for fairness. Um, and the point you raise about the capping, the capping of the capital fund contributions, um, I think, is, a, is an issue that needs to be discussed. Just for everyone's information, the committee has put together a document that answers uh, Sabra's position on a whole 60 recommendations. The Minister has been referring to that document, so thank you for your... I promise to listen to that word. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. <laughs> okay, he's gone. Obviously in a hurry. Um, we do appreciate his making the efforts though to come. I'm sure he's in a, um, got a, quite a busy time in the Ministry at the moment and leading up to the state election. Okay, um, Christopher Picton, uh, thank you very much for coming away from your press conference. Um, we do appreciate you coming along and uh, you did throw us out a little, but um, <laughs> now's your chance. Thank you. Um, yes, well, thank you very much, Roger. And uh, I can hardly uh, complain about the minister ducking off when I was late. Um, but uh, as I'm sure everyone can imagine, it is a pretty busy time uh, for Frank and all of us uh, in state politics at the moment. And um, if you watch the news tonight, there'll probably be uh, two seconds of you know a grab from Peter or. Stephen Mulligan or me, but that was from a 45 minute long press conference that went a lot longer than expected. So apologies for that. Um, it's great to be uh, with uh, Sabra, Sabra again. Uh, acknowledge Frank Pangello, a parliamentary colleague uh, from the Upper House. Um, acknowledge the Minister who's had to depart. Acknowledge uh, we met on the traditional lands of the Ghana people. Um, I, this is a uh, very personal uh, policy area uh, for me, uh, not just because um, I represent uh, a significant retirement villages in my own electorate, in the Sands at Seaford, in Moana Views, um, uh, and uh, also in Huntville Heights as well, um, but also because my own grandmother lives uh, in a retirement village as well at Netley Grove. I don't know if we have anybody from Netley Grove here today. Um, but uh, I, I want to make sure uh, that we have a good system that works for retirement village residents, uh, not just for my own electorates, not for the whole state, but also for my own family as well. Um, I think that retirement villages uh, can be uh, excellent. They can provide uh, a fantastic uh, retirement lifestyle uh, for people, uh, but there clearly can be issues. And over the four years that I've been the Shadow Health Minister, I certainly have heard from a number of communities where there have been issues uh, raised. Uh, both in terms of uh, particular management issues that occur at some villages uh, uh, where you know, sometimes there are unfortunate people who are put in charge of managing villages that cause conflict and issues at the village. Sometimes it's about those issues of um, the management and maintenance fees that people are charged and what they're being used for and how they're being charged. Sometimes it's about uh, the contracts that were put in place and I know I've seen um, uh, some people who've given me a uh, contract that they've been uh, provided, which is sort of like mini white pages, um, and how somebody who's not a QC is going to be able to understand what they're signing up to um, is beyond me. Um, and then clearly there's issues in terms of if people decide uh, to leave a village in terms of getting repayment, uh, but also in terms of some of those issues where people have uh, put in place um, uh, additions to the village, whether it be solar panels or uh, improvements to the kitchen, etc. Uh, and you know, it's a sort of bizarre situation uh, where uh, you know, you're charged to remove things which have actually led to an improvement. Um, so uh, I think that this is an area that does need further reform. Um, I was uh, obviously very supportive of the work that happened um, under the previous government to uh, take us a step further under when Zoe Bettison was the minister. Um, and uh, I think that did make a step in the right direction. But I think now, a few years on, I think we can see that 
that hasn't gone far enough in terms of providing, uh, the, getting the balance right between making sure that we have retirement villages that are economic, but also that people have the security in terms of uh, all of those issues that they're confronting and that we've got an ability to try to resolve. Um, so I have looked at the, uh, the PEG report, the independent report that's been uh, released. Uh, I think that there's some very good uh, recommendations in there. Uh, I think that there's things that we can certainly act on uh, relatively quickly to improve the situation. Uh, but I think that there is still a few other things that uh, need to be followed up and need to be worked on. Uh, and I'm committed to working with the association if we were to be elected uh, to do that because uh, I know that the people in this room uh, play such an important role in terms of knowing what's actually going on on the ground in these villages. I mean, you're sort of like you know, the mini uh, elected officials in your own village and uh, that I'm sure comes with uh, some uh, complexities at time and trying to make sure that you're representing uh, all of the uh, people's interests in the same way that Frank and I have to balance that uh, for the state. Uh, but you can be that fantastic voice of providing us feedback in terms of exactly what those issues are. Uh, and that's why I'm committed to working with you. Um, I think that we should be able to have uh, a, a new bill that updates at least uh, the recommendations from the PEG report uh, within a year after the election. Uh, I don't see any reason why that shouldn't be possible uh, at all. And if I'm elected as the Minister, I will be tasking the Office of Ageing Well to work with uh, you, to work with uh, people who live in retirement villages uh, to put that in motion. Um, but I think that there's a couple of important things that I think we do need to uh, continue to work through uh, as well in terms of how uh, the system should be set up beyond what, you know, there's some good but there's largely technical recommendations in that report. Uh, one thing that I do think is very welcome is increasing the powers uh, of registrar to be able to deal with issues that occur. Um, I think clearly this has been an issue that goes back to, I think it was 2000. 12, maybe, when we had the select committee investigation uh, into uh, retirement villages, where it was originally talked about having an ombudsman uh, that would provide uh, that, that service. Uh, that turned into essentially being uh, part of the role of the Office of Ageing. And, and I do want to say that I think the Office of Ageing will uh, uh, do do a great job in terms of uh, supporting people in their villages and working through the complexities in the legislation. Uh, but I, I have met many people who have uh, faced that issue of um, not being able to resolve their issue and then being faced with the question of, do you have to go to say case? And effectively a sort of quasi legal case to try to resolve that. And that, that is a significant uh, burden for people to bear uh, to go through that. And, you know, people have got issues in their families, their health, you name it. Uh, and to add to the stress and pain of going through that process as well, I know that there's a lot of people um, who would uh, rather just sit it out and hope it all goes away rather than go through that process. So I think having some additional powers uh, for the registrar to be able to deal with issues, I think absolutely needs to be dealt with. Uh, I do think that we do need further clarity in terms of uh, issues in terms of fees, maintenance fees. Um, uh, I have met many residents who have been uh, facing issues when it comes to um, uh, villagers making decisions about certain things wouldn't be paid for out of the maintenance fees that everybody's paying, and then residents' committees being forced to pay for some of these things when you're already paying all of this money into this kitty which accumulates. Um, and uh, transparency around how that's being used what it's being used for. Um, I think it's absolutely important and I think that we can uh, improve that uh, in further legislation. I think that there also needs to be improvement in terms of the way that we uh, try to uh, make sure that people can know uh, what they're getting themselves in for when they sign up originally. Um, I think the previous Act changes took us uh, some step forward to doing that, uh, but I don't think that's gone far enough to doing that. Uh, I think we absolutely need uh, to improve that. Um, I, I don't want to see a situation where we're continuing to see these white pages style contracts that people are having to sign up to uh, without understanding what's in them. Uh, and then lastly, which I know is a big issue uh, for many, many people in terms of uh, exit arrangements, 
Um, the PEG report says uh, well, it's a bit hard for us to work this out because we don't have enough data. And like was said, you know, who knows when that will be looked at again. Uh, well, if I'm elected minister, um, I will task the Office of Ageing Well with doing that, not in five years' time, but immediately. We need to do that. I don't see why we can't get that data uh, to have a good look at that issue uh, because I know that that is a big issue. I know that there is a disparity between uh, what happens across states in this regard uh, and a very stressful situation for people who are put in that situation who are having to wait uh, 18 months. Um, and so uh, I think that we can act quicker on that than what seems to be uh, the current state of affairs. Uh, and if I'm elected minister, certainly can to do that. Uh, just very quickly, am I running out of time? No, pretty yeah. close. Okay. Um, just very quickly, I mean, uh, I think the other key thing that I think affects everybody uh, in retirement villages is in terms of uh, what's happening in the health situation as well. Uh, and that's certainly our key focus in this election. Uh, is to end the ramping crisis because we're currently in a situation where if people call an ambulance uh, that you're facing the longest waiting times in Adelaide of any capital city in the country and that has increased dramatically over the past few years uh, and that is worrying for so many people um, and uh, I have spoken to far too many people who uh, have a fall, have an injury at home, uh, lying on the ground in pain having to call an ambulance and they're not getting one in 15 minutes, they're not getting one in 45 minutes, they're getting one in four or five hours, uh, which is uh, not what should be happening uh, in a first world country, a first world state. Uh, we need to provide the resources for our hospitals to fix the ramping situation, but also for our ambulances to make sure that there's more capacity to get to people quicker. We have some incredible world-class clinicians, uh, but they are spending half their time apologising when they turn up uh, to people's homes at the moment uh, because they're, they're getting there so late and if we can get them there earlier they can make an incredible difference. So um, thank you very much for having me. I look forward to working with the association and hopefully we can help to improve the situation <coughs> and the legislation for Thank you. We do have a couple of questions. No for worries. Us, if you don't mind. Grill me. Grill me. <laughs> no. No. Oh. Sorry. Sorry, Mary. No. Um, Rita, no. Just sit down for a minute, please, and we'll check. Um, we've we've got written questions. We ask for written questions. So if, if we have we'll, time, if we have we'll take time, some we will later. take some. Okay, sorry. So no, there's no worries with me. And certainly, um, if, if it's not allowed, I'll, I'll come and chat to you afterwards if you like. Yeah. 
Well, um, thank you, and thank you for your question. I mean, I, I can absolutely understand the frustration that you have. Um, and um, I know that there is a lot of people who are in retirement villages who are frustrated. There's some people who are perfectly happy and there's no issues whatsoever, but there's some people who have been battling issues for a long time uh, and things haven't improved. And I think people had hope when the last act changes came in that a lot of things were going to improve, and I think some things have. I think some things have not improved uh, since that time. Uh, we've now, I'm not in the government, clearly, I'm in the opposition, uh, but we've got this report uh, that was done only because the law said that the report had to be done when the last law uh, changed within a certain amount of time. Um, and as I said, I think that it touches on some of the important things, but it doesn't address some of the really critical things that are that are of concern for residents. Things in terms of how fees work, things in terms of how those exit arrangements work, things in terms of how people uh, get into contracts in the first place. I think that we can take uh, those actions further. Um, I, I'm obviously not the minister yet. Um, we've got an election coming up. It's up to you to make your decision in terms of uh, who you want to vote for, in terms of who you think uh, has the ability to implement that. I guess we've got the uh, ability to say, well, look, we previously uh, have taken uh, the act further. We have pushed this previously against significant opposition at the time, if you remember, from the retirement village industry. Uh, and uh, my priority uh, is to make sure that we get that balance right, that we are looking after the people uh, who are in retirement villages, that you do have rights, and that you do have the ability uh, to have somebody uh, whether it's a registrar or an ombudsman, uh, whoever it is who's got some power to intervene in situations. Uh, because at the moment that clearly uh, isn't happening and I know people will feel alone in that situation. And you've got Sabra, but that is you know, a volunteer-run organisation. Uh, Office of Ageing Well, I think, do the best that they can. Uh, but clearly there are situations that require some intervention. And I think uh, just telling people, I'll go hire some lawyers for $10,000 or more, uh, or take everything up with SAFE Act, clearly hasn't worked. So um, I think I'm very keen to work with the association on those other issues. Uh, if we're elected, um, I think clearly what's in the report isn't the end point uh, in working through these things. I think that there is a number of things that have been left on the table that we need to resolve, uh, and that's what I'm committed to do, uh, and to have an act uh, within the Parliament uh, relatively quickly to try to resolve some of these issues. Thank you. Um, one of the issues that affects all these residents is code of conduct and the management of the assets. The PEC report makes recommendations to introduce an industry code of conduct and an asset management program. We know there is going to be a lot of pushback from operators because of the costs involved. Will your, if you are elected, will your government support the introduction of a strong code of conduct and an asset management program? Yeah, well look, I, I haven't sort of turned my mind to that exact question because I'm, um, to be honest, code of conduct can be, you know, strong and powerful or they can be completely, you know, um, I won't say the word, but weak um, and of no use whatsoever. I mean, what what would you hope to see the Code of Conduct try to resolve? Um, so as operators have got to operate in a fair and even manner and no discrimination against people. Yeah, well, I think the most powerful thing is to try to put some of those issues in the legislation you know, rather than the Code of Conduct. Uh, because if it's a code of conduct, code of conducts are usually voluntary um, and are pretty usually toothless targets. Um, so I, I want to make sure that we've got a piece of legislation that gives you the, the best possible legal balance in terms of uh, your rights. I mean, obviously, there's a balance of rights and responsibilities. Residents have responsibilities as well. Uh, but the more that I think we can set out some of these things in the legislation, uh, mm -hmm. would be would be significant compared to having a code of conduct, which, you know, you could look at any number of industries that have code of conducts and people don't necessarily follow them. But you've just highlighted the problem for us in the fact that unless it's an enforceable code of conduct, mm. we have two other choices. 
talked to Vanessa and her team for God's sake. There is no other way for us to get our message across or to get our concerns across. That's why we're pushing very strongly for an enforceable code of conduct on these items. And, and I think that I think that comes back to what I was saying about um, a registrar or an ombudsman or having that power that somebody will be able to intervene in situations without having to go to state yet. Yeah, uh, because I think that clearly uh, people feel pretty powerless at the moment. Uh, and I think the more that we can try to uh, have some independence in that process. And as I said, I think Vanessa and the team at the Office of Aging World do the best that they possibly can. Uh, but they can only work within the realm of the legislation that they have before them. We strongly support the formation of the registrar, yeah. but the unfortunate part is the registrar is dealing with history. It's not dealing with today. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peckton, for um, your Pardon me for expressing your views on what we've got coming through uh, in relation to the um, report from PEG. And uh, we again thank you for taking the time out today because we know how busy it would be for you. Okay, um, now I've now got to find my place. <laughs> um, okay, as has been stated earlier, this push for a better balance of consumer protection, greater financial transparency, and a fair ago on village departure has been going on for a number of years. With input from previous committees and members, and much of SARA's current review submission is still restating issues mentioned in SARA's submission leading up to the 2016 Act. We must get the deserved changes now. The fight is only beginning. <clears throat> we need to make sure that the next stop steps are not lost in the myriad of issues the new government will be facing following a state election and these last unprecedented, unprecedented can't get that word out, we'll say the last two years of the pandemic. Um, obviously, no one's ever planned for something like that. Our understanding is that the paper will be issued at the end of June this year for consultation on proposed changes. Members' support will definitely enable our efforts to ensure we can finally get the legislative changes we deserve. We are, <clears throat> we are producing a worksheet for members and we were going to show it up there. I don't think we've got it up as yet, but we're going to give you an example of what Brian has really been involved in and putting together. It's up. It is up. <laughs> there we go. If we go up to page five, please. Okay, it's, it's to give you an example of um, what we've been putting together. Um, and we plan to circulate this document out to our members so that you are all aware of the important issues. And it's very important that we present a unified voice. While some of you may have different viewpoints on what we have shown in there, we would remind you that SABRA has compiled this information over a number of years based on facts and issues supplied by members over a range of villages throughout South Australia. We are confident, however, that our priority issues strike a balance in the interests of all members. Leading up to the expected June consultation process, we are asking our SARA members to write to candidates in their village electorates and remind them you are looking for their support in getting these important legislative changes made. We have marked our important issues in the worksheet and we'll distribute that to you. Obviously, any changes made after the consultation process, it will be all debated in Parliament prior to being proclaimed, which is why it is important that electoral members in your village areas are made fully aware of 
the issues that are important to you. We also plan to issue some media releases to further inform and gain support from the public. When the paper is released by the incoming government and we have some idea of the consultation timeframe, we'll be contacting as many members as possible and consulting with you to ensure that we are meeting members' expectations on the issues being addressed in this legislative review. I assure you, your committee is dedicated to working hard to gain as much from this review as can reasonably be expected. As your new president, I've been blessed working with a great committee, a truly dedicated group, currently following through on all the achievements and hard work of the previous presidents and committees. And I thank you for your attendance today and for listening. I guess we've got a bit of time up our sleeve now, so if, if there are any questions from the floor, we'll see if we can answer them for you. Sorry, I'm just changing. Yeah, yeah. If you'd like to stand up to the microphone here, if you don't mind, then everyone can hear you. The operator of our village 
is cutting back on maintenance instead of increasing it. When I went to the village, it was 55 to 62. Now it's 78 to 82, and half the people coming in are 80 odd. I used to call it only maintenance. Now I'm not allowed to climb ladders or lift any objects, so I'm relying on them to do it for me. I can't get it done. So we need to step up. And I know my friend, sister over there, said, you know, we could just sit back and relax. Yeah, that's the trouble. I think too many of us are sitting back and, and think. I've spent lots of years, I was on staff for five years. I was on that side committee. So I'm one of the people that steps forward and wants to do it. I used the ARAS a lot. When I want information, when I want legal advice, I go there, I get it. I really do say that, but that's it. But I've gone through the review of the Act, thanks to Chris. And the big issue that's in there that's really irking me, and it's one that's irking me, I've been in retirement villages for 18 years, two different ones. So I know all about retirement villages. But the thing that's irking me is I've never been able to get details on management expenses. that they don't have to disclose the amounts 
I mean, they have to disclose what they're spending on, but they don't have to disclose the amounts. So we just feel that's wrong. Um, they've got to show us exactly what they're spending on the advertising, training, whatever else as well. Um, why shouldn't we know? Can I have one comment to that? Just one brief one comment. One quick comment. I'll be quick. <coughs> Rod White, Committee Member of the uh, Woodcroft uh, Village. Um, everything that Rose just said is true. And other people in here know I've got a bugbear about management fees that they will not disclose. On the annual report that we have from Lifestyle, the very last item after a list of accounting items, on the uh, operating concern, ongoing profit. Now, profit is not an expense, it's not a recurring expense. It shouldn't even be allowed, it's been raised in the past, but it's not going to come. But it's that sort of issue, we just don't know. They're making two million a year off the last couple of villages on management fees. Just two million. Unaccountable. Plus silence. Unaudited. Plus? Plus silence. Plus silence. And then, so that was a brief one. They're actually mentioning profit. No, but they don't tell you how much. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, Brian, just a minute. We, we are addressing these issues, um, and it's good that you get up and speak about them. And one of the big things we do need is people to speak up. The, it is a problem, I know, where people feel um, threatened in lots of cases, and it shouldn't be. You should have the right to express your views. So please come forward. Frank, nice to see you again. And Chris, um, my name is Brian Chisholm. I am on the staff committee. I just wanted to reiterate the way about not speaking up. I spoke out at my village and I was requested to resign from residence. Now this is how this is how bad it gets. And I thought, you know, I can go and resign. And I felt there was one way to be, and that was to join Sacra and work from the higher level. But it's important that everybody is allowed to have their say. In, in fact, in, in our village, we have not had a Residents committee report since last night to the residents, and I think that's in the brief you had, if I'm correct. So these issues are, are very important and they need urgent action. And just one final thing, uh, just to support Brian, is the code of conduct should become a part of the legislation. Thank you. Okay, well, I think we'll call it quits. Uh, we've got a 10 minute early break, but uh, that's good. Um, we can all sort of head off and have a cup of coffee and calm the nerves. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Roger.